The following message is a production of Tony Broom Ministries. David had some disappointments in his life. He had some things that we might could use to say, well, I don't know too much about this guy. After all, he lied, he committed adultery, he had people murdered and killed, and he was responsible for deceiving people. A lot of things you could say about him that would go against the praise and worship part and the anointing and one who would dance before the Lord, one who would play on the instrument and one who would praise God, be so anointed that he could prophesy about a coming Messiah who would save the world. Think about ourselves. We would not want people to use our past against us because we don't have a past anymore. Jesus has forgiven our sins. He's taken our past away from us. We don't want people to use our past against us. And that's the way it is about David. We should not use his past so much that we would forget the wonderful person he is and the things that he did for God. Think about Solomon. I mean, who else would you think about one to be writing about wisdom than Solomon? He was the wisest man in the world, but yet he wasn't too wise when it came to women, folks. 700 wives, 300 concubines. And yet he writes to us and tells us how to have a good marriage and have a good home and have a good relationship. How in the world can you put those two together? Well, it's because God anoints his word. It's the anointing on the word of God. And even if Solomon and David at times didn't keep their own advice, it's still the word of God. I would hope that we would certainly practice what we preach. But whether I practice what I preach or not, it's still the Word of God. God's Word will stand. And there's a verse that I use. I kind of change it around a little bit, put a little humor to it. In Romans chapter 4, verse 3, I think it is. Let God be true and Tony a liar. That's the way I use it anyway. Let God be true and every man a liar. In other words... God is true no matter what. His word stands no matter what. We should live the best that we can, and Jesus will help us. The Holy Spirit will help us. The Word of God will help us. But David's songs are the heart of worship, the pilgrim. Our verses today are from 2 Samuel chapter 22, and then verses from Psalm 7 and Psalm 19. A central truth, God is always worthy of our worship. He is worthy to be praised. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, the Lord's name is worthy to be praised. We are to praise Him and bless Him at all times. Not just when it feels good or when the birds are singing and the sun is shining. We are to bless the Lord at all times. David said that, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Let my mouth be filled with thy praise and with thy honor all the day. That should be the prayer of our heart. Get up complaining and murmuring and finding fault with the government and wondering why things are the way they are. And newspaper didn't come on time. The coffee don't taste right. And just start off in a bad mood. We ought to get up praising God and worshiping Him. Thank God for another day to be able to be alive, to worship God, to have the dawning of the morning to shine upon us and for us to be able to be a part of it. To have right mind enough to be in the mind that God has given us to worship Him and praise Him. Our Bible focus, I will give thanks unto Thee, O Lord, among the heathen, and I will sing praise unto Thy name. Second Samuel 22 Verse 50, I will give thanks. It's a notion of the will. It's a moving of the will. It's an act of the will. It's not something you have to do, but it's something we certainly should do to give thanks unto God. I will give thanks unto thee, O Lord, among the heathen. There's some heathen out here. and I know you can say amen to that. You think about your neighbors. You think about people around you. But all of us were heathen. There's some people in this world who might be what we would consider too high class to ever think they were heathen. 
But we were all sinners. Originally, we were all sinners lost without Christ. And it doesn't matter whether you are born in Rockefeller Mansion or whether you are born on Skid Row. If you're lost without Christ, you're lost. You're in sin. And all of us need a Savior. And we are heathen. And we need to be reached with the gospel of Christ. David didn't just say, I will praise you among the saints in church. I will praise you among those who are doing like I'm doing. He says, I will give thanks unto you among the heathen. Because that's a testimony. When the world hears us, if we are heard doing like they are doing, acting like they're acting and being like they're being, there's not no difference. But if they hear us giving thanks unto the Lord, giving praise unto God, there's certainly a difference. And they'll know it. They may not turn around and just fall at our feet and even fall at the feet of Jesus and just automatically start living right. But they will know there's a difference. They will know that something is happening. They will know that somebody is different on the block that we live on. Somebody's talking differently and we give praise unto the lord you don't have to preach a sermon to everybody you don't have to jump up down on top of the table but we should give praise unto him and give thanks unto his name i will sing praises unto thy name to sing unto the lord one thing that every christian has is a song every christian may not get the opportunity to sing but every christian has a song You may not be a good singer, but you certainly have a good song. Well, how can I say if you are not a good singer, but you certainly have a good song? How in the world can I say that? Because every Christian has a good song. Every Christian has a good song because what and who we're singing about. That's what the idea is, and that's what it is all about. He has put a song in my mouth. Even praise unto our God, David says. David not only had a song in his mouth and in his heart, but David could sing. We would say it like this, David could sing good. Some of us can sing good and some of us can sing not so good, but David had a good song and David could sing good. And even if you can't sing well, you still have a good song in your heart. God is our rock. So many times in the scriptures, we read about him being the rock. In the Old Testament, He's the rock. He's the rock in the wilderness. He's the rock in the weary land. In the New Testament, He is the rock, the stone that the builders rejected has become the headstone of the corner. He is the rock upon which the church is built. I will build my church upon this rock, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He is the rock on which our faith is built. We are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ Himself being the chief cornerstone. God is our rock. 2 Samuel chapter 22, verse 1 and 2. And David spake unto the Lord these words of this song in the day that the Lord had delivered him out of the hand of all his enemies, out of the hand of Saul. This song came as a result of the experiences that David had come through, that God had delivered him from the hand of all of his enemies, and especially it makes note of from the hand of Saul. That was one of the biggest threats that he had because this was the one who was after his head, trying his best to kill David many times. And David had to escape for his life and had to run and had to be a fugitive. And God is to be praised because He delivered him out of the hand of all of his enemies and especially out of the hand of Saul. And He said, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. The Sunday school lesson talks about the rock being the foundation. The rock being a place on which you can hold to. The rock being that which is hard, that which is solid. Our Christian faith, believing in God, living for God, loving God, serving and praising God, is something that is steadfast and sure. It's not like the shifting sands of time. It's not vacillating back and forth. 
It's not like the tide that goes in and out. It's not like the sun that we would say comes up and down. It's not like the wind that goes and blows about from the north to the south. Our Christian life and God Himself is a rock that we can stand upon and a rock that is a sure foundation. A rock that is the same rock that He always was. He is my rock. He is your rock. He's the preacher's rock. He's the bishop's rock. But I thank God that He's my rock. He's a rock that I can identify with. He's the rock that you can stand on. He's the rock that won't roll, but He's the rock that'll put your name on the roll. Hallelujah to His wonderful name. He is my rock and my fortress. When you need a fortress, when you need something that's strong, something that is sure, and we need that today. It's not an insurance plan that's strong and sure. It's not a government that's strong and sure. And thank God for the government that we've had that which was built upon that which is good and is built upon that which should be for life and liberty and pursuit of happiness, that which should make for a strong government for people, that which should stand for righteousness, that which should stand for nobility, and that which is true and right. Thank God for that. But we need more than a government. We need a fortress. We need a Jehovah God. We need a rock on which we can stand. My Deliverer. He is the one who delivered David. And He is the one who delivers us. The God of my rock, in Him will I trust. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation. My high tower and my refuge, my Savior. Thou savest me from violence. God is that rock. He is that shield and fortress that we need. The rock. The rock of ages. The rock of Gibraltar is one of the biggest rocks in the world. But it's nothing compared to the rock that we have. The rock of our God. There is no God, there is no rock like our God. In Him will I trust. We can trust Him. Because He never has failed us. And the song said, He never has failed me yet. They can take that yet out of there. Because He never will fail you. He is my shield. Not only is He the rock, but He's the shield that is around us. And nothing can get to us if we live in His will and we stay in His way, the way that we should walk. Nothing can get to us unless He permits it. And we are to stay behind that shield. Where we get in trouble is we get on the other side of that shield. We get off of that rock. We get to doing our own ways. I was reading a verse today that says, Man did that which was right in his own eyes. Oh boy, you get in a whole heap of trouble when you start doing that which is right in your own eyes. We have to do what's right is what God says is right. And stay on the inside of that shield. Don't get on the outside of it. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Don't get on the outside of it. you got to stay under His canopy you got to stay in His tent. You have to stay under the cloud where the glory of God will shadow you and overshadow you and you will dwell in that secret place of the Most High and abide under the shadow of the Almighty. He is the horn of my salvation. He is my salvation. My high tower. When you need a place that you can run into... You can run to the rock. The song said, I can run to the rock and the rock will stand by me. Hallelujah Hallelujah to His wonderful name. We can run into that high tower. The name of the Lord is a tower. The righteous runs into it and is safe. My refuge. We need a place of refuge. And we have refuge. When the storms of life are raging, stand by me. We have a refuge that we can run into that tower. The strong tower. My Savior. He's my Savior. How do I know? Because He saved me. Thou savest me from violence. So much violence in the world. David was a man of war. 
But even he got tired of violence. So much violence that he had to deal with. So many enemies. And there were enemies that were right around him. There were enemies within and enemies without. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. And you think about the part that says, Fightings within and fears without. O Lamb of God, I come. Everywhere you turn, David had these enemies to deal with. Some of them were enemies of his own people. Those others were enemies of the people around him, the heathen, but they were enemies. And then King Saul, of course, that big enemy that David was never an enemy to him, but he always considered David to be his enemy. And David never did anything wrong to him. He was always faithful to him. But yet, he had to run and he had to hide and he had to do all this. It took so much energy that we have to waste living in this world, just surviving. And yet, it takes away from what we really want to do because we could use this energy spreading the gospel of Christ. And sometimes people wonder, why are you not spreading the gospel of Christ more? Well, we're just trying to get by. We're trying to get our family out of debt and get us out of debt. And we're trying to make it in this world. So many things that in this world that you just have to deal with. And at the end of the day, you don't have energy. You don't have zing enough to do anything else. Well, I know that God has a plan and purpose. And just like David... He had a lot of affairs to deal with too and God helped him and the same God that helped him will help us. We can act spiritual and we can act real high and man, we can win the world for Jesus and yes, God wants us to win the world for Jesus. But we live in a real world and at the end of the day, our feet get tired. We struggle to take our shoes off. Sometimes you wonder whether, am I taking my shoes off or putting them back on? (laughs) Hard to tell sometimes. Verse 4, I will call on the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. As we call upon Him, that's prayer. He is worthy to be praised and we praise Him. This tells me that the anointing, as we praise and worship God, the anointing will actually work against our enemies. Now we're not conscious of it. Lord, I'm going to praise you so you'll smack Him on the head. That's not what we feel, but that's exactly what's happening. When we are praising God and worshiping God, instead of murmuring and complaining and moaning and groaning about all these things in the world that we do have to deal with, as we praise and worship God, it actually works in the place of the supernatural. The anointing is against those forces of evil, and it puts down the devil and all the evil forces. It's not the people. That's who we vent against a lot of times. But it's not the people. It's the spirit that's behind it all. The evil spirit. And that's what David was mindful of when he said, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from mine enemies. You can read this in Psalm 18, which the psalm actually puts it in better flowing language in the English. In verse 32 here in 2 Samuel 22, For who is God save the Lord? And who is a rock save our God? He is the only God who is the only Lord. He is the only rock. There's no other God but our God. And it reminds us of what the New Testament says. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. There is no other way to be saved but through him. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Verse 47, The Lord liveth, and blessed be my rock, and exalted be the God of my salvation. He is a living God. He is a rock. He is a God of salvation. God is not only our rock, but He is our vindicator. Some people have problems when you think about David singing about the rock and singing about the wonderful God and the songs of praise and the songs of anointing and how wonderful it is. And then you turn over in the same psalmist, the same 
person, the same anointing, really, is talking about these songs of what we call vindication, vindicatory psalms. That is, psalms that speak of judging evil and those who persist in not serving God and living for God. Some people have problems with what is called the vindication psalms. They don't think they ought to be in there. They don't think they're inspired. But God does inspire all of His Word. And He writes about Joshua. He writes about Jericho. He writes about the wars and things that are happening. God doesn't approve of war, but it's part of life. It's in the Word of God. And David is saying, I am on the side of God. I am on the side of righteousness. And those who will not live for God, those who do not want to serve God, they have to be judged. There's no other way. Psalm 7 verse 1, O Lord my God, in Thee do I put my trust. Save me from all them that persecute me and deliver me, lest he tear my soul like a lion, rending it in pieces while there is none to deliver. And he's calling on God to save him. In the first part, he calls on God to save him, and he praises God and worships God. And now he calls on God to save him and deliver him and to actually judge those who are enemies to righteousness. That's what the songs of vindication are all about. He's calling on God to judge evil, and he's actually agreeing with God. When you stand on the side of God, you're not only the side of love and kindness and grace and mercy, but you also have to be for a God who judges sin and hates sin and will vindicate those who are righteous. He will punish the wicked and establish the just. In verse 9, Oh, let the wickedness of the wicked come to an end, but establish the just. For the righteous God trieth the hearts and reigns. He knows what your mind is. He knows how much you can take. And that's what he's talking about. We have to think about this first part of the verse. Let the wickedness of the wicked come to an end. Who doesn't want that to happen? What's wrong with saying, oh God, put an end to this. Let this come to an end. Not just because you get to an end of a term in the election, the thing runs out, but God, let it come to an end because we can't take much more. Let it come to an end because it's so evil. Wickedness is on every hand. Oh, Lord, let the wickedness of the wicked come to an end. That is a notable prayer to pray, I think. And God's Word establishes that. Establish the just. The righteous God tries the hearts and the reins. My defense is of God, which saveth the upright in heart. God judgeth the righteous, and God is angry with the wicked every day. You think God is just pat a cake, pat a cake, put them in a pan? That's not God. God loves us and He has mercy on all of us. But all this evil that's going on in the world, people are thumbing their nose in the face of God and flaunting their ungodliness and wickedness in the face of God. God doesn't just sit up there and say, hmm, wonder what they're doing down there. God knows everything that they're doing. He knows all of what's going on. And the psalmist here says... Let God save me. Let God save the upright in heart. God judges the righteous. He will bring out their righteous cause. That's what it's talking about. And God is angry with the wicked every day. If he turn not, he will wet his sword. He hath bent his bow and made it ready. God has got his bow and arrows ready. He's getting ready to judge sin. He hath also prepared for him the instruments of death. He ordaineth his arrow against the persecutors. God's got His weapons. Whether you're talking about bombs, God's got some of them too. The Scripture said the chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. The Lord is among them as in Sinai, even in the holy place. God has got His weapons that He needs to execute judgment upon ungodliness. And we should not feel funny or strange about wanting sin to be judged. I'd like to read you what the Scripture says in Psalms 109, verse 6. Set thou a wicked man over him, and let Satan stand at his right hand. Boy, that's not a good wish to wish for somebody, is it? 
But he's talking about this is what's going to happen. If you just persist in being ungodly, if you don't want to serve God, if you don't want to have anything to do with God, here's what needs to happen to you. When he shall be judged, let him be condemned, and let his prayer become sin. Let his prayer become sin. And here's a good prayer in Psalm 109, verse 8. You don't like the president you got? You don't like the government you've got? You don't like the people you've got? They're ungodly. They are worshiping false gods and they're doing things that are not right. Here's a good prayer to pray for them. Let his days be few and let another take his office. Let his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. Let his children be continually vagabonds and beg. Let them seek their bread also out of their desolate places. Let the extortioner catch all that he has. And let the stranger spoil his labor. Let there be none to extend mercy unto him. Neither let there be any to favor his fatherless children. That sounds cold and harsh, doesn't it? But this is vindication. This is what happens when people don't serve God. And we have a whole world full of people who are not living for God. Oh, bless them, Lord. Love them, Lord. Bless them. David says, in effect, we're feeling sorry for the wrong ones. There are people in this world who are serving God and struggling. Those are the ones that we need to say, Oh, God bless them. God help them. God bless them. Let his posterity be cut off, and in the generation following, let their name be blotted out. Let the iniquity of his fathers be remembered with the Lord, and let not the sin of his mother be blotted out. Let them be before the Lord continually, that he may cut off the memory of them from the earth. We're talking about this sweet psalmist. He's also a man of war because that he remembered not to show mercy, but persecuted the poor and needy man that he might even slay the broken in heart. This is why David is saying the things that he's saying about this, because of the kind of people that he's talking about, the kind of lifestyles that they're living. As he loved cursing, so let it come unto him. As he delighted not in blessing, so let it be far from him. As he clothed himself with cursing, like as with his garment, so let it come into his bowels like water, and like oil into his bones. Let it be unto him as a garment which covereth him, and for a girdle wherewith he is girded continually. Man, that's some rough stuff. You're reading the Bible too. Think I need to get back over here in Second Samuel chapter 22 verse 17. I will praise the Lord according to His righteousness and will sing praise to the name of the Lord Most High. There is a difference between serving God and not serving God. And you saw it in the scripture I just read. There is a difference between living for God is so camouflaged and so we have almost unisexed it now. Or oh, we don't really look that much different from the world. We wear about the same style of clothes and we act just about like they do. The only difference is us is we have a little Jesus and they do what they do. No, there's a lot of difference. The scripture said if you're in Christ Jesus, you are a new creature, a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So I realize that Jesus tells us we're to love our enemies. We're to pray for them who persecute us. We're to bless them that curse us. But there's still the same one who said that, the Lord Jesus, is coming again to this world. And when he returns to this earth, he's not coming to play. He's coming to judge this world and rule them with a rod of iron. To dash them in pieces, like Psalm 2 said, like a potter's vessel. And he's coming to execute judgment upon all who are ungodly and all who refuse to live for God. Our glorious God, Psalms 19. Psalm 19 tells us about this wonderful song that David is singing unto God. And he tells us that even the nature, even the creation of God, there's no mother nature, no, no mother nature. It's Father God. That's who it is. God created the heaven and the earth. God created all things. Not no mother nature, not no mother earth. Even if it is Mother Earth, who's the Father? Still God. Psalm 19.1 The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth 
His handiwork. No matter where you're from on this earth, you may not know the things that we know about God. And there are many people who have not heard about the gospel, about the name of Jesus. We need to keep on spreading the gospel. Keep on sending out the message of life. Keep on letting the light shine brightly, blazing the trail for Jesus. With the Holy Spirit of God, using the Word of God, through the people of God, to reach the world for God. But whether you're a heathen in the darkest corners of Africa and India, or whether you're somebody way up in the top skyscrapers in the big cities of the United States, you still ought to be able to look up and to see that surely there's a God that made all this. It didn't just happen. It didn't just come about. The heavens declare the glory of God. You see the sun and the moon and the stars and the birds that are flying around. The heavens are declaring the glory of God. It says there's a God up here that made you. When I consider the moon and the stars that you've made, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? The firmament showeth his handiwork. The expanse, the atmosphere. Think about the heaven, about the planets, about earth itself. It shows God's handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. Whether you're looking at day, you're thinking about day, or you're looking at the night, thinking about night, and you go to bed in the evening, you have somewhat of a quiet, peaceful night. And then during the night, boom, 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 boom. And the thunder rolls and the rain comes and refreshes and waters the earth. And you get up the next morning and the sun comes out and starts shining. All this is God's work. Day to day, utter speech. Night under night shows knowledge. It shows knowledge of God. Those stars up in the sky. The moon that shines at night, the sun that shines in the daytime, God did all that. There is no speech nor language, and that word language is word. It doesn't matter what kind of word, what kind of language you speak. There's no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their sound is gone forth, the Scripture says, into all the world, and their words to the end of the world, to the end of the earth. God is speaking through creation. He's speaking through the things that are going on. But creation and the elements and the things as wonderful as they are, the animals and the birds and the fishes of the sea, as great as that is, that's not enough to save us. Even the law that He gave us, and thank God for this law in verse 7, says the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. It will convert your soul. It will show you how to live right. But you need a Savior. You need someone to come in the New Testament and to give His life on a rugged cross to save us from sin. We needed more than the sun and the moon and the stars. We needed Jesus Christ, the Savior, to save us from sin. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. God will show you how to live. And you can gain strength and wisdom from the testimony of God. It shows you you can make it through the things that you face in this life. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. God's principles, His teachings, His direction is right, and He will rejoice your heart. It's good to know the truth. It's good to know the things of God. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. God will show you that the way that you used to live is so rotten and corrupt, and the way that you're living for God now is so wonderful and so holy. The commandment of God will enlighten your eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. Once you know what the fear of God is, your life will never be the same. And you may reel and rock, and you may get off the path a little bit, but when you fear God like He wants you to fear Him, He will draw you back into the way of righteousness. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. And you certainly cannot leave out verses 10 and 11, even though it's not in the printed text. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. God's Word is better than honey. It's better than grits and eggs, even though that's kind of hard to beat. But God's Word is really good. 
Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. God will reward you. And you can hear the psalmist singing out to God. And then verse 14, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for such a wonderful life of King David, such a wonderful song, the song of redemption, the song of triumph, the song of tribulation and trouble, but yet the song of praise and worship. When he comes and he says, Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Let my mouth be filled with thy praise and with thy honor all the day. Let this be the prayer of our heart, and let this be the song of our soul, to sing unto the Lord, to worship your holy name. Let us spread the message of life so that others can hear and be saved, and you'll put a song in their heart, a song that will live forever. While the ages roll, I'll keep on praising Him, and my voice will never tire or grow old. My song will ever be, praise the Lamb who died for me, and I will sing it. While the ages shall roll, we give you praise for this word. And I pray that many would come to Jesus in his name. Amen. The preceding message has been a production of Tony Broom Ministries. 